So appreciate you coming out and joining us for our annual Kennedy Lecture, um, the first one we've had in, in person uh, since COVID started. So excited to see everyone. So first of all, um, I want to start by thanking, um, as always, the Kennedy family for their continued support of this lecture series, who's without support over these many, many years, you know, we would not be able to bring these great lectures to you. Um, I don't think, are Tom and Lisa here this morning? Yeah. Ah, Tom's here. Thank you, Tom. Um, and I know, <laughs> there you go, we couldn't, yeah, we can't tell anybody with their mask on. And then I think um, your brother Richard and his wife Christine weren't able to make it, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, so thank you again. We do appreciate all the support from the Kennedy family. A couple of housekeeping things. As everybody knows, the restrooms are around the corner. I think Susie and they're pulling the coffee. So the coffee is done for the morning. So hopefully everybody has their mugs. We have chaser tickets in the back. Father Gaunt brought, is it the Kara report? Yes. Uh, the Kara report. Um, there's some uh, brochures in the back. He's got his business cards back there if you want to pick them up before you leave today or during the next break. Um, he's got that with us. So the agenda today is really simple. We're going to start. I'm going to turn this over to Christine here in just a minute. She's going to start us with a prayer. After that, Father Tim's going to come up, and he's going to introduce our guest speaker, Father Gaunt. Father, after Father Gaunt's presentation, we'll take probably a 10-15 you know, minute break. Then we'll come back, and Father will do Q&A. Since it is a small, mighty group here, we're going to just do Q&A one of two ways. We're going to pass around a mic. Um, or we do have index cards in the back and pencils. So if you're more comfortable, write your questions out and then we'll read them for you. Okay? We'll remind you too before we go on break. But with that, I'm going to turn it over to Christine for our prayer and we will get our program started. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. On this chilly morning, we greet you, God, with awe and wonder filled with gratitude for the generous legacy of St. Peter parishioners Keith and Joan Kennedy, passed to us as a gift from their sons, Tom and Richard. We're here because we desire, we share their desire to be part of a church of deep thinkers, propelled by faith, a church with flesh on its bones, calluses on its hands, a church where people know us by our love. We thank you, too, Father Tom Gaunt, who brings us a taste of our past and joyful hope in the challenge of what we face as a church of the future, who reminds us that we're on this journey together. Heavenly Father, precious Lord, spirit of love, you who've been in relationships since before the beginning of time, who created us in your image, a perfect union of perfect love, Help us discover how deeply connected we are, how we're created out of love, for love, to love, and to be one. Help us hear your voice and the words of your son to both go into the whole world and to go out into the streets and gather all you can find. Help us draw together and return to the people you created us to be, a church of perfect union. In your image, and in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Father Tim Stevens, the pastor here at St. Peter in Uptown Charlotte. And it is a great honor and a privilege to present Father Tom Gaunt as our speaker this year for the Kennedy Lecture. Father Tom's life has represented in many ways the changing face of the church and religious life. He entered the Society of Jesus in 1971, a recent graduate of Gonzaga College High School. And I mention that not only for the shout out that Gonzaga deserves, but also that date, 1971, that Father Gaunt last year celebrated his 50 years in the Society of Jesus. And during that 50 years, he truly has lived out much of the dreams and the hopes, not only of the Society of Jesus, but in the church in America. He was ordained a priest in 1981 and then spent 10 glorious years 
here in the state of perfection, as Father Devereux liked to call it, the state of North Carolina, in a variety of roles of service to the, to the Diocese of Charlotte and culminating in a year here at St. Peter as assistant pastor. During that time, he earned a master's in public administration from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, where his thesis topic was diocesan synods. Again, an important topic as we as a church think about synodality and how we will move forward as a church. After his time here at St. Peter, he went and completed his Ph.D. in city and regional planning from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And in true Jesuit fashion, after having earned that Ph.D., on city and regional planning, he was made the assistant to the provincial for formation and studies. <laughs> the Jesuits have a sense of humor. <laughs> Among other th things, during that time, he had either the, the honor or the sad privilege of telling me that my first assignment as a young priest would be to come here to St. Peter in Uptown Charlotte back at the end of the last millennium. After his time as assistant for formation, he served as the second in command at the Jesuit Conference in Washington, D.C., and then light bulbs went off over the heads of people, and he was finally able to fully apply that Ph.D. that he had earned many years ago, and for the last 11 years, he has served as the executive director of CARA, the Center for Applied Research in the Apostolate a research arm of Georgetown University and the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. In that role, he has served as the author of many articles and books that highlight the many ways in which the church has changed in recent years and how religious life has changed. And so it is a great privilege to present to you our lecturer for this year, Father Thomas Gaunt of the Society of Jesus. Thank you, Tim. I, I don't think my mother could have done a better introduction. <laughs> and I've, I've mentioned to a number of you and those uh, who are the real old timers, uh, I was here before St. Peter's became a Jesuit parish. So I was uh, living at Our Lady of Consolation up the street from 1984 on when I was director of planning for the diocese. So I was here to welcome Father John and Father Jean in 1986 and uh, moved down the street to uh, St. Peter's. It's wonderful to be here when the invitation came and they said, well, we're going to do this in Biss Hall. Well, I had the old image of Biss Hall. <laughs> and I thought, okay, you know, I guess that'll work, you know. And I'm thinking of that old stage. And anyway, this is quite remarkable. It's beautiful, beautiful. As we get started, let, let me explain a little about where I work now at CARA, the Center for Applied Research in the Apostolate. CARA was started about 60 years ago by the bishops and the major superiors of the missionary communities of priests and sisters. And it was started at that point at the end of the Vatican Council to provide for the research needs of the church. That's the mission, period. And so over nearly 60 years has been striving to do this, looking particularly, the goal is, on the applied research. So we are not sitting here, I, I would go back like Father Hoy, thinking big theological thoughts. You know, for Kara, it's why do people come to church? You know, why don't they come to church? Well, you know, who are the people who are part of the church? Uh, how do we understand different ministries, aspects that are going on? So it's the applied piece, and the users for Kara really are bishops, pastors, church leaders across the country. And we're trying to answer just practical questions that people bring to us. So kara has been doing that uh, for almost 60 years, and I've been there the last 11, and it's been delightful, and as Tim mentioned, I had a 16-year interlude between Chapel Hill, finishing my studies and uh, then taking up some of the direct work that I had focused on uh, years before. But for Kara, really the, a key piece of what the work we do is, is providing context. 
and particularly in this era that we're living in of such polarization. Kara has a situation uh, that's very unusual in our world today and in the church is that pretty much everybody trusts us and believes us because our focus is purely on the data. We are not theologians. We're not policy folks. We're simply telling you what the data is. And we turn it over to bishops, church organizations, parishes. They need then to figure out how to apply this and what it really means for their local situation. So uh, we, we end up being kind of the, the point of reference for, you know, radical traditionalists all the way over to kind of the radical leftist groupings within the church. They'll all come back and cite Kara as the source for data. I'm not always happy the way they cite it, but uh, we do have that standing. So in this invitation today, trying to look at, trying to weave a whole variety of things going on. So we have this uh, synod process that Pope Francis has begun. We're also uh, marking the 50th anniversary of the Diocese of Charlotte. And so I'd like to, to pull together a whole mix of items uh, to kind of frame the question and what we're looking at. And a lot of my question, uh, concern is who are we as a church, and do we actually know who we are, and are we engaging and listening to one another? So, let me start off. I was ordained in 1981 and found, oops, well that's good, and found myself assigned to Hot Springs, North Carolina, up in the mountains. And I came to meet Bishop Bagley, and he said, partner, we need to have, start a church in Mars Hill. And so he gave me $3,000, a slap on the back, and it was clear, don't come back looking for anything more. Um, and that's how it began. I had been ordained about seven weeks. And, and I was with Father Graves at the time, and I came out of the, the meeting very stunned. And I said, Andy, you know, uh, what am I supposed to do? And he chuckled. He said, well, when I came... I didn't get $3,000. <laughs> so I came and began this ministry in Mars Hill with a focus on Mars Hill College uh, in Madison County. And we began that. There were seven known Catholic families in that area. And that's what we started with. And then Bishop Bagley, to add to this, he uh, asked me to initiate a peace and justice commission for the diocese. And so it was, again, you know, get something started here. And he must have been thinking in threes because I also got $3,000. <laughs> you know, and again, this sort of pat on the back, don't, don't come back looking for anything more, uh, to begin this Peace and Justice Commission in the diocese. And with that, as a young priest, only ordained seven, eight weeks, this put me, when I look back on it now, into this extraordinary situation because I was going to begin as a young priest learning and working with two very extraordinary pastors, and that was Bishop Michael Bagley and Father Andy Graves. Here we are. So here's a picture. It was taken in 1980, so the year before. Bishop Bagley on the left, Father Graves on the right. Uh, the two of them, are, Father Graves is six years older than Bishop Bagley, but they were both ordained the same year. And I want to tell a little story about each of them to frame the, the context here. Father Graves, in 1937, as a young priest, Jesuit priest serving at Holy Trinity Parish in Washington, D.C., is assigned to Madison County. And it's the same year the Jesuit, the one Jesuit who served in North Carolina had returned to New Orleans and the bishop said he wanted a Jesuit and the New Orleans provincial said no. The bishop went to Rome, met with the general of the Jesuits and the state of North Carolina was then moved from New Orleans province to Maryland province and Father Graves was sent. <laughs> <laughs> and so he showed up 
1937, you know, in the midst of the Great Depression and into southern Appalachia. So one of the, you know, most highly affected areas. This was a, an area, North Carolina was two-tenths of a percent Catholic. So two-tenths, less, far less than one percent. Two-tenths. There were just a dozen or so Catholics up in Madison County at the time. And with the Great Depression. And Andy came and he stayed there from 1937 to 1984. So 47 years of his life. Very remarkable for a Jesuit to be in one place that long for almost 50 years. And when I was there, we would, Andy would travel with me uh, up to Washington occasionally. And we'd come down back along 81 and then cut through just before Knoxville to get into Hot Springs. And Andy was this esteemed figure. So we were chatting one evening, and it was around dusk as we got off the interstate to come in through the mountains. And that evening, Andy just commented to me, he said, you know, when I first got here, I used to dread seeing the mountains. We're sitting in the car, and I just figure I don't know quite what to say to that. Um, so I'm quiet. And then he continued, uh, and he said, you know, when I came, I didn't know what to do. You know, I grew up in Washington, in a city. And here I was, and there were no Catholics. There was no nothing. And there was no money. You know, he went out begging all the time to just support himself. I just sat quiet. And he said, Tom, I was so depressed in that first year. And one day I sat with the scriptures. And I just opened the Gospels. And he said, I looked on. And Andy, being you know, 50 years in the mountains, started to sound more like a Baptist preacher. He said, so I looked on. <laughs> John 10.10 10. had the verse down. And we're just driving on this car going into the mountains. And he says, and, and, and Jesus says, I came so that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Wisely, I just kept quiet. <laughs> and he said, and I realized that's what I needed to do. So I just took care of people. And whatever people needed to have life more abundantly, I took care of. And that really became 50 years of his ministry in life and what he became known for in the mountains and across the state. So Andy then focused not what would have been this more formal role of trying to be a pastor there in the mountains where he only had a handful of Catholics. If you needed to get to the doctor, he was one of the few people who had a car. So he would drive you to find a doctor. If you needed help getting a job someplace, he would go and help you. He was an educated man. You know, you needed letters written. You needed somehow somebody to go down and, and argue at the courthouse for you. That's what he did. Whatever people needed, he focused on that. And he was there by himself for decades and decades. Uh, and became this kind of more legendary and esteemed figure in the mountains. So, I'm so glad that night in the car I kept my mouth shut <laughs> and just let Andy tell the story. Bishop Bagley, he was ordained in 1934, and he was from Springfield, Massachusetts. And as a, a young seminarian, he volunteered to come to the home missions in the Diocese of Raleigh, covering the whole state. And he would later talk that really the best job he ever had was back in the 1950s when he was the superintendent of Nazareth Orphanage in Raleigh. He would always talk about the kiddos. He spoke about it. And the many years that he was head of the orphanage. And you could just see his voice would change. He'd become so animated. And I thought, isn't this intriguing? He's a bishop now. But if you ask him what he really wanted to do, he would love to go back and just be in charge of the orphanage. So in 1972, he becomes the first bishop of Charlotte. 
And he takes as his motto, which was very telling, we have loved the brethren, is his Episcopal motto. And in 1975, then as a young recent bishop, he leads the other 26 bishops of the Appalachian region, New York through Mississippi, in writing the pastoral letter, this land is home to me. What's notable in that pastoral letter when it comes out, this is not written as a sort of church document. It's not talking about doctrine and catechesis and that. It's giving voice to the people of Appalachia and their culture, their, their struggles and the challenges that they face. So it's a only letter of its kind that has come out that way from uh, American bishops. And it becomes a quite notable uh, item. When Father Graves at that time was a younger priest, post-World War II, he focuses on resettling refugees from Eastern Europe, in mainly in Eastern North Carolina. And then later, as Bishop of Charlotte, he focuses on resettling refugees from Vietnam and Cambodia. He's the one who backed up Sister Frances Sheridan in building up quite a complex refugee resettlement office that brought in so many uh, refugees into the Charlotte area. And one of the things that was notable in that, the refugees were very vulnerable, very vulnerable. These are the folks coming off the boats. Uh, and so many of them uh, were widows with children. And a part of it was there were a number of, kind of evangelical communities that were kind of going after them, kind of recruiting them in to their churches. And the concern was they needed to get something stable, something they knew. And they were almost all Buddhist. And so Bishop Bagley took a property next to St. Anne's Church, and he turned it over to the Buddhist community and managed to recruit a Buddhist sister who came and was kind of the head of that Buddhist temple. And Bishop Bagley used to love to say, you know, I'm the Bishop of the Diocese of Charlotte. I have 64 parishes, 21 missions, and one Buddhist temple. <laughs> so I bring out these stories and the, these illustrations uh, to highlight that as we celebrate this 50th anniversary of the Diocese of Charlotte, it's good to recall some of the roots of the diocese. So much of the diocese uh, as it's created was grounded very much on, on Bishop Bagley, but also on Father Graves and the, what the church has become in western North Carolina. So this past year, Pope Francis initiates a synod process for the entire church. And in the preparatory document, for a synodal church, communion, part participation, and mission, Pope Francis speaks of the life of the church as being a journeying together. There are a couple of key phrases that Pope Francis keeps returning to, both in about the synod, but also he is referenced uh, over the years. So the, that first quote, our journeying together is in fact what most effectively enacts and manifests the nature of the church as the pilgrim and missionary people of God. The journeying together, you know, is what most effectively enacts and manifests. And the second one, as a synodal church in announcing the gospel, journeys together. How is this journeying together happening today in your particular church? What steps does the Spirit invite us to take in order to grow in our journeying together? So I wanted to start off with this witness or the stories about Bishop Bagley and Father Graves as really pastoral leaders almost a century ago who epitomize very much that journeying together with those who were so often ignored, pushed aside, and seemingly invisible to so many others. Bishop Bagley, Father Graves, 
they listened to very different voices. They were exceptional men in their time. They're exceptional men today for that. And they accompanied different people in their needs and in their struggles. And every step of the way, they shared the gospel message. So, what I want to start with is this sense of who do we understand the Catholic community to be? Today, we live in a very different world from Bishop Bagley and Father Graves. But the challenge of listening and accompaniment is still there. This morning, I want to look at this challenge in a more limited manner. How is this challenge just within the Catholic community? So I'm not going to look at this in terms of the whole community around us. Just within the Catholic community. As we're asked to journey together in this synod process, it's a focus on our fellow Catholics that we are called to be listening to, that the church as a whole is trying to embrace and engage. So how might we do this? And at CARA, again from the work we do, so much of our research and writing is focused on understanding the context of our Catholic community. If we're going to be a listening church, we need to know who are we listening to. And the who can be a very complicated question. So just who are the Catholics? Where are the Catholics? And how do they engage their faith? More often than not, the Catholic community is not who we think it is, which is a challenge for listening and accompaniment. So the first thing is, if we think we are the Catholic community here this morning, we are so far off base. I just have to look at us and say, this is not <laughs> the Catholic community. So here's a, a slide on religious affiliation among U.S. adults. And the religious landscape of the United States has, was pretty stable up through the 1980s. But a big change starts in the, in the 80s and 90s. A dramatic step in this is that other Christians, that's kind of everybody else but the Catholics among the Christian communities, this declines from 60% of the population to just over 40%. So just a few years back, the United States was no longer a majority Protestant nation. Protestants went to less than 50%. The Catholic community for religious affiliation, you see the little green dots. And basically, that remains fairly stable. It goes up and down a little bit by a percent or two over the years and declines just a tad. Other religions, which would be the, the lower bottom one, the uh, I guess it's red on that, uh, they also remain fairly stable. That's about 1%, 2% there. The no affiliation or the nuns, as we like to call them, they increase from less than 10% upwards to some 30% at this time. And this is the one that has had the biggest change. And what we see, especially over the last 30, 40 years, is this quite dramatic move of religious disaffiliation. People are disaffiliating from any religious body. And the nuns, the non-believers, these, these do not necessarily mean that they are atheistic or agnostic. So often enough as we do survey and collect the data, we see that they are, they're religious people and spiritual people engaged in things. They just do not identify with any religious body or group. And so what we see here is that as a, as a nation, 
we are becoming more and more a religiously disconnected group of people. It's this disconnection that's occurring. So th this is quite the phenomena. And just recently, uh, the Pew came up with a few weeks ago another set of data. And what they have found, and this is particularly in the last two, three years with the pandemic, is a continuing drop among the other Christians, an increase among the nuns. And what is most notable in the graphic is that the Catholics did not change. And this is kind of the question, why, why the Catholics did not shift in that? So the, the issue on the disaffiliation is, is having this greatest impact really among uh, Protestant churches. When we look at the Catholic population, one of the things that really is important to us and often gets forgotten in some of our debates about who is Catholic or, or, or in that, is that in the Roman Catholic Church, if one is baptized, then one is a Catholic. I don't want to tell the pastor this. You don't need to register in a parish to be Catholic. You don't have to contribute to the parish to be Catholic. You would only have to attend Mass to be Catholic. The church's theology and grounding is that if you are baptized, you are a Catholic. So the church's primary stance is one of inclusion. If you're baptized, you belong. And you can't unbelong. You know, formally one has to make a formal renouncement of the church and a formal you know, engagement to another religious body and to be considered not a Catholic. So th this is a key piece because we have lots of public figures, you know, uh, that are Catholic or baptized Catholic, but then left in a formal way or did not. So I mean, one of the key things is uh, President Reagan was baptized a Catholic. You know, Vice President Pence uh, was a Catholic, and actually his first job out of, out of college was as a church parish minister. Uh, Sarah Palin's a Catholic. Mayor de Blasio, well, late mayor, no, late former mayor de Blasio. <laughs> yeah, straight. Uh, you know, so we go down this, this listing, but the, the key to the church is if you are baptized, you are a Catholic. You can't except by some positive action, exclude yourself. You can't get thrown out, you know, unless it's kind of a formal excommunications, which are extraordinarily, extraordinarily rare. And that kind of gets lost because there is no distinction of who's a good Catholic and who's a bad Catholic. You're a Catholic by canon law, by theology. And this often gets distorted in, in our more polarized environment. So in this graphic, what's interesting is this is the estimations that we've done. So in the United States, is back a few years, or were you Catholic at some point in your life? That's over 100 million people. But that would also include, you know, Ronald Reagan, Sarah Palin, uh, folks in there. So then... Uh, the next piece is, are you currently a self-identified Catholic? And this is what we take. So you are baptized, and you're saying, I'm a Catholic. That's about 78 million people across the country, somewhere in that range. Then the, the next come down to, do you attend Mass on Christmas and Easter? <laughs> you know, this is not a high bar uh, <laughs> to show up at Christmas or Easter. But 53 million say yes. What's notable, 25 million say, I am a Catholic. I never come to Mass. Never. And then you get down to a Mass once a month, 38 million. For Kara and our research purposes, this is often where we say, these are active Catholics. You know, and you're at least once a month. But also, you know what parish you, got, you belong to. You probably know the name of the pastor. But it may not go much beyond that. And then we come down farther and we're asking about attending Mass once a week. 
or every week, and it gets about 18 million. So we get about, you know, a quarter of Catholics are regular Sunday Mass attenders. And then upwards, 40-50% are showing up about once a month. The key is the 25 million, or about one-third of all Catholics, never come to Mass, never are engaged in the local parish. They are Catholics. There are not good Catholics and bad Catholics. There are Catholics in our church. And this is this larger church community. And so the question comes, who are they and why is this happening? Because also as sociologists of religion, what we find is we don't have this same phenomena with other churches. You know, the only ones who come close to it are Jews and Mormons. That, you know, if you're raised in this grouping, you tend to keep identifying even though you haven't gone to the synagogue or the temple in ages. So those are the two groups, and they're pretty small compared to the number of Catholics. So this is this engaging piece when we start to say, we the church. When we look at the region, what we're looking at is that, you know, if St. Peter's, we, we don't quite have the same boundaries that other parishes do, but when we look at the city of Charlotte or Mecklenburg County, the number of Catholics who are showing up in the parishes are probably only about half of what are here. And probably there's a third of all the Catholics in Mecklenburg County who've never stepped in the door of a church. But they are Catholics. And this other piece then goes on this religious retention rate. And it's an important thing, and this is something that's fairly unique to the United States, is that the United States is unusual for the amount of religious churning that occurs over time. And this has gone on from colonial times to our own day. In most other countries, the religious identification of individuals, families, and groups remains fairly stable in comparison. So today, the majority of people with Irish surnames are not Catholic. Though we know the vast majority, when they immigrated, were. It's just now crossing the point that the majority of those with Italian surnames are not Catholic. You know, so you see this change and back and forth in the shifting uh, that, that goes on. And so in the United States, historically, there is this marketplace of religions. And so it's thinkable for people and, and socially acceptable to be moving from one religious body to another. In Europe and other parts of the world, no, 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 your family was set and defined this way, and it really was extraordinary for you to leave that. You know, it was so defined, but not in the United States. About half or more of all adults in the United States today do not self-identify with the church community that they grew up in. So fully about half of Americans you know, what they grew up in and what they identify with today is different. Now, this, was, this survey d done through uh, Pew a number of years ago, it simply asked, what were you raised as and what are you today? That's it. Two questions and then figured out the retention rate. What's notable here is that the Catholic community is really has the highest retention rate of all the Christian groups. And what can be surprising, again, on the context, I'm sure you've all seen the headlines or news stories that former Catholics make up the second largest religious group in the country. And it's framed in a piece of, you know, the church is going to hell in a handbasket, you know, get out while you can, because everybody's leaving. <laughs> what it leaves out is that Catholics, 78, 75 million Catholics, the second largest group are Southern Baptists at about 15 million. So we are five times bigger than the number two, much less all the other churches. There's only two, three million Episcopalians in the whole country. You know, it, it, it's, we lose touch with the context 
of just how big the Catholics are, or in one sense, how much smaller all other churches across the country are. So when we begin to look at this, then this goes with the same point. It's just interesting that this has this high retention level. Now, the Baptists are just below it, and you can see Orthodox Christians there, Lutherans down the line. What's also interesting here is the nothing, nuns, you know, at 42%, the atheists at 40%, the agnostic at 30%. You know, so the majority of their children grow up and identify with a religious body. You know, if you wanted to play the odds, you want your children to, to be identify with a religious body, raise them as agnostics. <laughs> You know, but th this is some of the, the reality. And those that are have a higher rating than the Catholics on retention, again, all tend to be much smaller in size. Uh, but this is key to see that piece is that in the country, in our history, is all this religious churning in marketplace, and that what we have is a whole environment that people are looking to belong, and that they are seeking. They are moving from one to another to another. So we can't think of this as somehow being a static environment. It's a very fluid environment. Add to this an item here in Charlotte and uh, the, the experience of the church in North Carolina is, is very evident of it, is that mobility appears to be a defining characteristic of the American experience. People are always on the move from one part of the country to another. So in the, the last century, we have the Great Migration, southern blacks moving out of the south up to the northeast, the Midwest, and some to the west. We have the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl and the movement of many people, you know, out of Arkansas, Oklahoma, Texas, out to, to the west, to California. We have post-World War II. You know, my father's from Mississippi, my mother from Missouri. As a boy, we never lived anywhere near that. And so, you know, if I saw relatives from where they grew up, you know, it was on a rare occasion. And actually, all my parents' siblings moved elsewhere also. So there's this whole movement of people after World War II. And then we have the whole phenomenon more recently of the Rust Belt and the Sun Belt. And the industries sort of fading in the northeast and midwest and the boom across the south and west. And so the, and the migration of other, from other countries simply adds more and more to this. But we look at just the Catholic population. What we have is back in 1950, almost half of all Catholics lived in the Northeast, and then about a third in the Midwest, and about one-eighth each in the South and in the West. By the time we get to our current period, the Northeast is now less than a quarter. The Midwest is down to less than a fifth. And the South is the center for, for the plurality of Catholics with the West at 26%. You've just had this massive, massive shift of people. When you look at the challenges of the church, it's almost like there are two different worlds. The church of the Northeast and the Midwest, and then the church of the South and West. In the Northeast and Midwest, you're sitting with empty churches and empty pews, not because people abandon the faith, but their kids got a great job in Atlanta or Charlotte or Houston or Sacramento and moved. And here in Charlotte, you know, it's building and building in these kind of mega churches and this, simply the scale of it. And this is not because the local pastors are incredible evangelizers. <laughs> you know? And when I've come to talk, to, you know, in the diocese, you mentioned this, and the pastors are there looking just overwhelmed at the sheer number. And we get our data and say, and the problem, the challenge is that our estimates are there are hundreds, if not thousands, of people every Sunday here in Charlotte who are not coming to church. 
is pre-pandemic because they can't get in the parking lot. <laughs> they can't get into St. Gabriel's. They can't get even into St. Matthew's. They can't get in, you know, to, to St. Mark's. It's just they can't keep up. There just isn't enough room. And so this, when we get in touch, and so we see that in all the challenges, sociologists of religion for decades have noted that mobility was highly correlated to religious disaffiliation. It's a simple factor that people move and are disconnected from their local church, and they don't reconnect when they settle in a new place or connect, or they do connect with a different church community. And we see that, again, in Charlotte, in this area. That would be very true. And I know back when I was director of planning for the diocese, we had, at that point, a couple of counties that still did not have a Catholic church. And I think it is Taylorsville in Alexandria County, up off of Interstate 40. I think it was up there that we were going to open a, a mission or begin having Mass on, a, on the weekend. And according to the best of the calculations we had down, we were expecting, you know, that there were about 70 Catholics, you know, that would be 25 or so households in the county. So we started that. You know, within the first couple of months, I think we had identified, you know, 250 people had shown up and just confounded in a sense, where did they come from? And again, these were folks who moved there. Driving to the next county was simply too far, or they only went it periodically, so the next county never even knew about them. But they weren't alienated from the church. It was just too much of a hassle to get to church. So when we began having mass in, the, in, you know, in, the, in Taylorsville, suddenly they're coming out of the woodwork. Um, and so there's this piece of this mobility the impact it has on us as a church community uh, is huge. Added to this is the phenomena over the last 30, 40 years of immigration. So immigration declined sharply through the 20th century and only began increasing really in the 1980s. And fewer immigrant families, after the change of the, the laws in the 60s and 70s, Few immigrant families were coming from Western Europe and much more from Latin America, Asia Pacific, South Asia, West Africa, East Africa. And what's a surprising piece is in almost every part of the country, this flow of immigrant families is often enough more Catholic than the regions where they settle. Now, it's abundantly true in North Carolina, you know, which... 20, 30 years ago was still 2% or 3%. Today it's all of 5 or 6% Catholic. But when you look at it and see, you know, that the immigrants arriving from Nigeria are likely to be 30% Catholic. You know, the immigrants arriving from India, though India is less than 2% Catholic, the immigrant flow is much more heavily Catholic. And the same when we get to... Uh, uh, other national groups. So we tend to expect Latin Americans, particularly Mexicans or Salvadorans, to be Catholic families. What we're surprised at is that the same is very true for the Vietnamese, the Koreans, the Indians, the Kenyans, and the Nigerians. What we have here is we look at this. This is simply the foreign-born adult Catholics. Back in 1980, the foreign-born adult Catholics were about 10% of the church. We move forward over 40 years, and the foreign-born adult Catholics are now over 25% of the church. One quarter of all adults. If we go to the children, it's even higher. So a common piece is when you look in a region, you know, if the Catholic population is not a quarter foreign-born, somebody's missing. Somebody's missing. And why are, there, why are they missing? And that's a, for us as a church, asking ourselves, are there voices being heard? And how does the church community accompany them in, in their arrival in the United States and engagement? 
And here's a quick look at some of the cultural and ethnic diversity. About 10 years ago, the Bishop's Conference commissioned Kara to estimate the cultural and ethnic diversity of the Catholic population for every diocese in the United States. The concern was that so many immigrant Catholic families and families of color were not known or were not visible to dioceses, parishes, and other Catholic groups. And if we are unaware of someone's presence, it's hard for us to even begin to listen to them, much less accompany them. And so Carol went through using the U.S. Census data, General Social Survey, official Catholic directory, other national data sources to provide the es estimates. When we published this and went by every diocese, and again, these are estimates that we're working on, we got an incredible response back from the bishops. And it kind of hit the, the goal the, from the conference staff is that we're simply unaware of who is among us. And so when we look, this is 2010. So this is 12 years ago. The Diocese of Charlotte, you know, it's almost a quarter of a million white, non-Hispanic Catholics. But 167,000 Hispanic Catholics. We'd have 18,000 Asian Pacific Islanders. 32,000 black African Americans. And then Native Americans would be about 5,300. So at that time, we'd count about 470,000 Catholics. Now, I think officially the diocese was probably counting about 250, 270,000 at that point. And that would fit what we count in the diocese officially often is maybe only 60%, 70% of who's actually here. And in Raleigh, you can see the same numbers. But what's telling is that in Raleigh in 2010, the uh, white non-Hispanic Catholics were already the minority group uh, compared to all others. And today, uh, overall in the state, even in 2010, today if we were to repeat this, I can guarantee you that for uh, Charlotte and Raleigh, the Hispanic numbers have increased even more and the Asian Pacific Islanders have increased even more. The black African American is probably about the same, maybe a little changes there. Same with the Native American. And the non-Hispanic white, the number may have increased, but what the portion would be even less. The Catholic community in North Carolina today is a majority minority community. But if we look into our churches and our engagement, that's not what we see. And I don't have to, I can say that not just because I'm here today, but I'm knowing the data that comes in. And so, but back to the sense of, you know, who are we actively listening to? So when we say we are listening to the church community, are we? Or are we listening only to this one smaller slice of it? And how are we accompanying one another uh, if we don't see this sort of mixing or some semblance of it within our identified Catholic community. And the key piece that comes with this in recent years has been a, a focus from some parishes and some writings that emphasize what is termed a radical welcome. That what we need is this sense of a radical welcome. By canon law, Parishes are defined as being a stable population in the set geography. The canon law definition of a parish doesn't work. And, and, and a matter of fact, just in fact, in reality, uh, it, it's not there. It's not real. There are few parish populations that have a stable Catholic group. What we see in the experience of the United States is this constant movement, mobility, and changing in the characteristics of the population. A parish, given the boundaries, the territory, is a dynamic, constantly changing entity. And if the parish and the parish community sees itself as being a stable group, then you're just missing the boat. You're missing the boat because that's not the Catholic community that's in your territory. It is not that stable. 
And so if we're thinking of ourselves as a stable way, we say, okay, we're here. We know who we are at St. Peter's. And here's our point that we're welcoming to guests and visitors who come to conventions. And we have a, a greeting committee. But it's from a stance that somehow we're here, the visitor or the newcomer is something unusual. We have to turn that upside down. And as a parish to understand ourselves as this always changing group, that in some ways the stable constant person is more unusual. So do we begin to think of ourselves that way and how we function in the parish? And focus is this term used of a radical welcome. How do we take all these people, and we know that mobility is connected to being disconnected, how do we reconnect and invite in, in that way, listening and accompanying all these others? So what are we learning from all this? You know, in our local church, who are the ones journeying together? When we say our church, who's a part of it? Are we aware of by definition, who is a part of our parish community. Now, for most parishes, you know, we get out the geographic boundaries, and I suspect here at St. Peter's, because of its uniqueness, probably only a couple people here actually live in the boundaries of St. Peter's uh, within the uptown uh, region. But for, for St. Peter's, or really the reality for parishes across Charlotte, you know, it's the city, it's the county. So, who is really a part of this Catholic community? Do we know who they are? Uh, and, and what are our efforts to engage them? The second item, who are our road companions, including those outside the ecclesial perimeter, as Pope Francis would say it? And so do our road companions on this journey include those who are at a distance from the parish? Or does it just include us? who are right here and active. So, our road companions, those who are hurt, those who are alienated, those who are disconnected, and probably most challenging, those who are simply bored. You know, how are they our companions in this journey? And then what persons or groups are left on the margins, expressly or in fact? Who's left out? And who's left out because of language? Who's left out because of orientation? Who's left out because they're isolated? And which can be very challenging today. Who's left out because of their partisan politics, whether they're red or blue or purple? Who is left out? And some of that is challenging because some of it, as we are more critical in our reflection, we realize that we can be very deliberate in who we leave out. So I next want to shift this then to Catholic engagement with the church life. So what do we know about how Catholics engage their faith, especially in their local parish community? So here's this listing. It's kind of hard to read there, but basically it's the visual effect. That little green dot doesn't move much. It's pretty constant over the last 20 years. This is weekly church attendance, and it's been measured for ages and ages uh, from Catholics and for, for uh, everyone in the United States asking. And so the, the question is often shifted a little bit. You know, did you attend a weekly service? Did you, you know, when was the last time you were in church? Uh, some different variations. But in this graph, what's notable is the remarkable consistency and this is the proportion of self-identified Catholics who say they attended Mass weekly. And it generally varies from 21 to 23 percent, all within the margin of error by and large. So about a quarter or a little less of all Catholics, self-identified Catholics, say they come to Mass every Sunday. And that fits with other data. During the pandemic, we found this dropped off quickly. But we started at CARA doing a measures in terms of people as they were, we looked at the measures pre-pandemic by Google searches and looked at who was searching for mass times. 
and we got a, a number. So we could follow that. And then we're also asking, you know, looking for mass times or mass online or on TV. And so as you can imagine, we had this big block, mass times, and this tiny little block on top, mass times on TV, online. And then when the pandemic hits, this drops down enormously, and then this starts increasing. And as we, we follow this, what we found interestingly uh, is that this quarter or so of Catholics participating in Sunday Mass re continues to remain fairly constant through the pandemic. That those who weren't showing up at church were also showing up looking, you know, online or watching on TV. So there's some drop off. This is a very soft figure, but, but the constancy of it remains. And now as the pandemic restrictions have eased, what we find is it going back up. So that at least prior to the recent Omicron outbreak, uh, at the end of the summer, beginning of the fall, mass attendance was, was almost back to what it was pre-pandemic uh, as we do it on a national scale. So variations in specific points. But so we have this constancy of who's participating. But what's in, again intriguing, quarter of Catholics are regular. There's another quarter who would be there, you know, at least once a month. But there's this big block, 50%, that's, you know, very seldom or never that are not part of the parish uh, mass. So this is, uh, Kara just recently conducted a national poll of young adult Catholics. And we asked them, why did they miss mass? And so here are the reasons why young, adu young adults, 18 to 35, so a national sample, uh, attending Mass infrequently. And what's interesting is to see that 86% uh, said it was a busy schedule or lack of time. 86% also said that they don't believe missing Mass is a sin. 64% said family responsibilities. 62% I prefer to practice my faith outside the parish. And then 61%, I'm not a very religious person. And then less than one half uh, cited an inconvenient mass schedule, other items. Yes? Just real quick, you're adding those two comments. Yes, so oh, that's the positive. So the but one is very much only and the other is somewhat or very much. So doesn't the first column include the second? I'm sorry? You are correct. I will fire my uh, consultant. <laughs> That's embarrassing. No, yes, you are very correct. I am sorry. I think I was being too hasty in my notes here. <laughs> but what you see is what, what, what stood out for us when we got, gathered this data uh, was this one, I prefer to practice my faith outside of the parish, 43%. We did not think that was going to be popping up there. Um, and so what does that mean exactly? So these are people saying they're, they're active Catholics. And in this study, we asked some more. And what we found out, particularly among young adults, is that young adults, we would have said in this age group, maybe about 15, 17% were weekly mass attenders. So this 18 to 35. That would not be unusual. As you get older, you come to church more often. And that's for everybody, Catholics, Jews, Muslims, everybody does that. So this kind of startled us. And what we were discovering is that while there may be only 15% coming to Mass regularly, that we're finding 30, 40% of young adults are engaged actively, regularly with some faith group activity in a Bible study, a sharing group, a whole mix of items. And so this was kind of a surprise as we're documenting it because it raises this question, if we just take as a norm, and this would be true among Catholics but also in other uh, denominations, that the Sunday service attendance is kind of the criteria that we knew that didn't capture everything, but we didn't expect such a big difference. And so for us it's like, uh, you know, are we kind of asking the wrong question? Because here are all these young adults. 
who are actively engaged in their faith and doing something on a regular basis about their faith and, and sharing it, but it's not at Mass. And when we see this large number who simply say, why didn't you come to Mass? Well, actually, you know, the, my Bible study group is much more fruitful and rewarding and beneficial to me than Sunday Mass. Uh, you know, not exactly where, what we thought, Expect, especially, you know, at that number to it. So it kind of raises this question of what's happening that's not in the parish. And back to this question, we look at the Catholic community, it's not just those who are in the parish formally, but this larger Catholic community. And here's looking at the, the sort of engagement with the sacramental life of the church. As you look at this, and this is uh, just looking from 2008 to 2018, the total Catholic population has increased in size every single year. So the Catholic population in the United States has not declined. Every year there are more Catholics than there were the year before. But that same Catholic population is becoming less engaged in the sacraments and rites of the church celebrated at the local parish. And so you have the, you know, a 30% decline in baptisms from 900,000 to 630,000. We have a 15% decline in the number of First Communions. Uh, we have a 10% decline in confirmations. 25% decline in the number of uh, marriages in the church. 25% fewer adult RCIA members. And 10% fewer funerals. Now, the funeral one I just found intriguing because we mapped this out and, you know, what's the trend line? A and, you know, if you're young enough at this point, Catholics will no longer die in about 30 years. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that it's just disappearing. <laughs> Those of us who probably have less than 30 years, it's not a great uh, note. But le let me tie in here so the, this disengagement. Now, some things like the baptisms, we actually find that the children don't get baptized, but when they begin school, they get baptized. So there's an uptick, but not nearly. You know, it comes up a little bit. Uh, so we capture a little there. The one I'd like to focus on is, is this piece about the funerals. You know, the older you are, the more engaged you are in the church. And again, this is true for Catholics, for everyone in every denominational grouping. So the older we get, uh, the more we get religion. And this especially happens starting around age 60, 65. So what is, seems to be happening here is that the elderly Catholics become disconnected at a time of great need for their community of faith. So what happens uh, that we're looking at is, is that older Catholics become more isolated. And part of this is grandma lives in Cleveland. You know, the kids all live in Atlanta or here in Charlotte. And how does grandma keep connected to the parish, you know, down the street? And finally says, nope, grandma, you got to move here to Charlotte. And grandma moves to Charlotte to a wonderful assisted living facility. But with that assisted living facility, there, there isn't an easy way to engage with St. Peter's, you know, or St. Mark's or wherever. Um, and so she's disconnected. But a, a tragic piece is Grandma, who was intimately a part of St. Leo's Church in Euclid, Ohio, is now disconnected doesn't reconnect the relationships that are gone when she's here and she's now part of St. Peter's in Charlotte. And so as this phenomena happens, what we find is the reality is uh, grandma dies and, you know, the children are scattered and this gets linked into the, to the increase in cremations. And it's like, well, we're going to cremate grandma. But, you know, because we have cremation, we don't need to have a funeral, you know, within five days. 
And so Grandma's cremated, and we're going to do a celebration of life later on when the kids are all back home and around. And you move a little bit of time later, and it's like, you know, this is kind of a downer to be doing a funeral, you know. And we've all kind of got used to that Grandma died. And in this scenario, what happens is Grandma is on the shelf in the garage. (laughs) Nobody intended this to happen. (laughs) But the theological piece is, Grandma, who is intimately a part of of a believing community, that believing community didn't gather in prayer to give thanks for her life, you know, to commemorate and remember her as part of the communion of saints, you know, much less than be into a more basic theological sense of what are we saying about the respect of the body, you know, and the remains and the sacredness of this and how we respond to it as a community. And the, 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 that sense of who prays for grandma? You know, she's more than just her children or grandchildren. You know, she's part of a larger web, but it disappears. It simply disappears. And so this is just kind of one way. And I think, again, here in Charlotte, you know, there's a kind of a humorous piece to it. But I, I suspect it's all too real that this is happening. And it's not because anybody intends it. You know, afterwards, kind of the, the children are horrified, you know, when they put it that way. But this is kind of what kind of unintentionally happens uh, in, a, in a situation. And so it's this disconnect, again, of the life of the church, the prayer of the church. Um, and this, you know, that's one vivid example on the, on the funerals. But we also see this, you know, down the line. And again, with uh, Catholic marriages in another area. So what we find is that Catholic community, more and more, still identifying as Catholics, but they're engaging their faith outside of the parish, and distinct from the sacramental rites of the, of the church. And how are they engaging their faith? Often enough, this is linked uh, to family devotions, home altars, blessings that are intimately tied to the immigrant experience. And so what we have found as we've collected some of this data during the pandemic is that there's more of a resiliency or vitality of faith within the Catholic immigrant communities that are have a highly ingrained uh, family, you know, and cultural sense of religion and faith and devotions than often enough that kind of white, non-Hispanic, broader Anglo community in the country. And the pandemic in that way, you're finding in immigrant communities much more flexible and shifting and moving, the white Hispanic communities often struggling more because if you're not going to the parish, what do you do? They don't have quickly enough that same fallback uh, or resiliency in that part of their faith life. You had a urgent question, or no, oh. I said I'm guilty of the, uh, grandma? My wife. Oh, mm, sorry. And so we're asking then for the same survey of young uh, adults across the country. Why are they less active in parish life? Um, And putting up some of the reasons. So we did this. And again, what we find here are the reasons. It's a whole mix. So 44% cited allegations of Catholic clergy sexual abuse of minors. 42% cited church teachings on homosexuality. I'm getting it right, yes. Uh, on the numbers. 35% cite feelings that older generations have too much influence in the parish. 34% cite the church's teaching on the use of birth control. 32% cited the roles available to women in the church. 31% the perception of the church's participation in politics and elections. And I give this, and we could spend a whole other day discussing each item, and exploring these questions at length. But the the key question here is we need to ask ourselves, how do we listen 
to each of these voices and accompany each one. So often our tendency is to say, well, this is what the church teaches. And it's like, well, you know, that's really not listening to what somebody's saying or trying to accompany them. But this can be the real struggle, especially when people identify issues and topics that can be rather volatile within the church or, or that the church just doesn't want to engage with at the time. You know, what Pope Francis com keeps coming back to us in this reminder, you know, we need to engage everybody and we need to engage every question. When you look at Pope Francis in terms of kind of a doctrine element, in many ways, Pope Benedict was far more progressive than he is. Uh, but because of Pope Francis's demeanor and engagement, which focuses more on the listening or that accompaniment, he's perceived being far more progressive. But in so many different, you know, more proper church statements, it's really somewhat the flip. So the, the key that Pope Francis is here is he's not sitting here trying to rewrite doctrine. But he's saying, if you disagree, that doesn't mean you're outside the church. Let me sit down. Instead of waving my finger at you, I should come and put my arm around you. And let's, you know, talk, have a cup of coffee, and just listen. Just listen to what people are doing. And so what we find is that for young adult Catholics, uh, how do they experience their church, their diocese, their parish as a listening community? As a community of faith who wants to be with them, who wants to accompany them. And so this recent survey data and what we're picking up just starts to highlight this more and more. And in different ways at, at Kara, we've been doing this for decades, is surprising to us. You know, when they come back and say, actually far more young adults are actively engaged in their faith, but it has nothing to do with the parish. So what does that mean? How do we engage? How do we accompany them? Getting to the end here. So, a number of years back, Kara surveyed hundreds of parishes across the United States as part of a project, and representing this whole diverse mix of the Catholic community. And we asked one of the questions was, what attracted you to your parish? And one of the things that often people are startled at is we come back and say, you know, overwhelmingly, Catholics are happy with the parish where they are. And people say, oh, that can't possibly be true. You know, there's this and this and this. We said, but understand, these are the Catholics who are a member of that parish. You know, if you're not happy with St. Peter's, you went down to St. Gabriel's, you know, or you went over the, to St. Patrick's or wherever. So there's a certain self-selection process that's going on here. And so when we ask people, what comes back is, you know, uh, it's open and welcoming spirit. The quality of the liturgy, the quality of the preaching, a sense of belonging you feel here. These are the things that, that people say, this is what attracted me to the parish. And, and I'm sure if we went through here, the same items would come up. You know, why are you here? Why do you come to St. Peter's downtown and navigate the traffic pattern around and try and find that garage entrance? I had to come with uh, Father Tim this morning because I would never <laughs> have found it. Uh, but so folks who are coming here, you know, there's a bit of an obstacle course to get here. So this would ring very true. But this is the voice of those who are in the parish. What's the voice or the experience of those who are not here? So at Carol, when we do this, and people are feeling real good about the parishes, I keep saying, well, it's those who are already showing up. And it's nice to hear that they, by and large, are happy. But the more critical question of who's not here. And so it's not, as we put here, parish life keeping U.S. Catholics in the pew. It's not simply about keeping Catholics in the pew, but the most important thing is inviting and welcoming Catholics to the pew. And this, again, is where what we're so often missing. We just kind of forget, and we keep thinking, it's us. It's us. And, and unintentionally, we're kind of leaving out so many others. So some of the conclusions here. 
Let's return to what Pope Francis writes in the preparatory document for a synodal church communion participation mission. The spirituality of journeying together is called to become an educational principle for the formation of the human person. How do we make journeying together an educational principle within our parish life? How do we apply that and ask that kind of as the educational principle of everything we do in our catechesis, in our devotional practices, in our social life? How do we form people to make them more capable of journeying together, listening to one another, and engaging in dialogue? So, as a parish, how do we engage in listening? And not just to one another, but also with those at a distance from the parish, the alienated and the hurt. How do we begin to accompany them? How do we change our mindset that is not just us here in St. Peter's, but it is this larger Catholic community. That's our parish, not just those of us who show up. And then our journeying together is, in fact, what most effectively enacts and manifests the nature of the church as the pilgrim and missionary people of God. I began my remarks by noting the 50th anniversary of the Diocese of Charlotte, and the witness of Bishop Bagley and Father Graves and their witness to journeying together. And their journeying together through their lives was with the poor of Appalachia. It was with orphans. And time and again, it was with refugees. And for both of them, in their witness, what we see is that they journeyed together and listened to those who were so often made invisible in our society. So I'd like to, to end this with a very secular quote. Uh, Jerry might be familiar with this person. So I'd like to quote John Forrester, who's a professor of city planning at Cornell University. And it's a quote I found when I was doing my own studies years ago. And I think it is key to our discussions today. Dr. Forster wrote, in listening, we may still better understand, explain, and cut through the pervasive can't, the subtle ideological distortions we so often face, including, of course, our own misunderstandings of who we are and what may yet be. Listening well, we can act to nurture dialogue and criticism, to make genuine presence possible, to question and explore all that we may yet do and yet become. When I looked up that quote a week or so ago to include here, I was taken aback. I had a general recollection of it. But I thought, you know, he was either ghostwriting for Pope Francis or... Uh, <laughs> but it's the same theme. Listening is a civic virtue, and it is a requirement if we are to be evangelizing disciples as Catholics. Pope Francis commends to us that it is in listening, in journeying together, that we most clearly manifest ourselves as the people of God. And so if we call ourselves St. Peter, Catholic Church, the people of God gathered here in uptown Charlotte, we need to be aware of and include everyone. Thank you. So as the uh, number of Catholics rise rapidly in the South, are there enough priests to journey together with them as, as we move forward? And, and are a lot of the younger priests coming out of the seminaries maybe a little too conservative or traditionalist to connect with these mainstream um, 
congregations that are not used to that. So the, the number of priests, the number of uh, men being ordained every year is for diocesan priests is basically stable or increasing a little bit, very little. Um, so the, what's driving the change is simply the retirements. Many more are, are retiring or dying. So that's the sort of the demographic tension in the situation. There's a, a larger number of priests coming from outside the U.S. At Carroll, we, we refer to them as the international priests. Those used to be kind of somewhat informal arrangements. Uh, today, they've become much more formalized. You know, the diocese, it's, usually it's an agreement between bishops. And so there's a piece of, a, you know, a priest may come from the Archdiocese of Abuja in Nigeria for five or ten year commitments. The Diocese of Charlotte helps cover some of the costs of the seminary training, items like that. So it's a very mutually beneficiary uh, arrangement that way. The number of priests in terms of to the number of Catholics, that ratio is going to continue to increase. Um, so there, there's not a change in that. Whether that's sufficient all becomes a variety of questions. You know, when I talked about the sacramental practice, I could turn around to, to Father Tim and say, gee, over the last 10 years, your workload has dropped by 15%. Uh, fewer baptisms, fewer marriages, you know. Uh, that, that's not, I don't think he would quite agree that that was the reality of what's happened. So you, you get a lot of changes. And another piece in the church is the, the rise in terms of a greater prominence to deacons in their roles in the church itself and then of lay ecclesial ministers. A particular challenge we find it at Cairo when we do national survey and data collection is people will say, well, you're not encouraging, you know, vocations. And I would just leave it at that. What we find, people are not encouraging vocations, whether it's to be a priest, a sister, a brother, or a lay ecclesial minister, or a deacon. As a matter of fact, we tend to find data that people were less encouraging for someone to be a lay ecclesial minister, you know, a professional DRE pastoral associate. So uh, a challenge is just across the board that in the Catholic community, for whatever mix of reasons, we just are not as encouraging uh, as one would hope for those church vocations. With the synod, with the synod listening sessions about to come on, are there best practices or thoughts around how to engage those people who are not engaged in parish life? Because, wow, we need to hear their voices in this listening process. Yeah, I'm not sure just exactly what the best practices are other than, than it's kind of wide open. Try something. Uh, you know, in, engage that you know in a very deliberate way, trying to engage, uh, particularly uh, young adult Catholics, and and here in Charlotte, you got a ton of them. Um, you know, and they identify as Catholic, but they're not showing up. So, so how to find ways, whether it's you know from theology on ta tap type of scenarios to others, of simply how to engage that, and then with the larger immigrant. Uh, communities would be. Uh, so d different dioceses, parishes are trying different angles to, to incorporate. The, the challenge with the current process is, is that from the Vatican announcing it and saying this is what we're going to do, it's for the whole world and it's coming to the diocese and you have it and you have like 12 months to figure something out. And you know, we're just not that flexible or quick on our feet. <laughs> uh, you know, so some dioceses are getting things going. Others are still trying to figure out how to do it. it. It's not an easy item. If you want to get all the predictable voices, we know how to do that real quick. But the challenge is how to get those who haven't been included. Well, that's a lot harder. Uh, you know, people have often asked us at Kara, well, you know, we, we, can we get a more in-depth information on the Catholics who aren't coming to church. <laughs> well, we need to be able to identify them clearly, you know, and then to be able to survey them. So if we start on a national surveying, 
you know, it's a whole thing. It just becomes so expensive and massive how to get down to that one group. Uh, but that's some of the challenge is the unengaged are not that easy to identify and then engage. So the listening is not something easily done. One of the charts you put up was concerned uh, those religions that seem to hold on to their those who are you know baptized in the church day and hold on to them for more years. But I noticed that the four that were above us, including ourselves, all have a lot of ritual and uh, maybe more rules and prayers that have to be said and uh, mass that has to be attended and um, it seems that maybe that's a significant thing that holds people together more than just loosey goosey you know come on Sunday if you feel like it mm. so is anyone is yes. there any comments on that yeah. so so what's key so the for the Jewish community being Jewish is not only a religious identification. It's an ethnic, cultural identification. So there are many Jews, you know, who never darken the door of a synagogue. Uh, and so that's uh, very clear. Uh, you, you get the same in terms of for the Mormons. So there's such a focus, you know, it is kind of the epitome of a family domestic church. You know, that is the core piece uh, of Mormon life and faith life is in that immediate family. So you get that. When you get the Greek Orthodox, you'll get so, you know. So, yes, there is a piece to it. And that's where kind of on the sociological side of it is saying it's exactly because of the rituals that are there. And there's sort of the domestic or familial quality that's there. So if I was back here as pastor, you know, one of the things I would say now, being a carrot, collecting all this data and work for the last decade, I would give a particular focus on that domestic, familial side of our faith. Only at carrot have I come to appreciate the importance of Advent devotions, of Lenten devotions, you know, of Our Lady of Guadalupe, of there are all, there's a whole variety of devotional practices that, you know, historically grew up very much in the families. And in many ways, we have not nurtured or fostered those as much. And the need we see here is that that often is the weak point. Uh, because the, the faith really is communicated in, through that family. And so we see in the pandemic, you know, for so many immigrant communities, okay, they weren't going to Mass regularly before. What's the big difference? They're still having prayers before the meals. You know, the mother is blessing each of the children in the morning. They still have the altar in the kitchen. You know, they're following this. The life engagement of faith, the liveliness of it, continues as if there was no pandemic. Where that isn't, you know, strong, you kind of see this weakness. So, yeah, I think you're... Very much on target. The ritual life is very key. One more thing that I see in the Jewish uh, faith. That community has so many activities to bring people together. They have their Jewish community centers. They've got their physical activity in schools. They've got preschools for children. They've got um, um, film festivals going on now. They, they put on plays. They've got dances and parties. But they're very intent on their people marrying the young people marrying the teenagers, but in the end, the whole life is around that community center. We cost a lot of money, but we don't have that passion about the gospel. Yeah. So, I mean, again, it, it's the things that, that encourage both kind of the family, familial devotions, practices, but also kind of, you know, as families together. The, the more to build on that, the, the evidence keeps saying this is going to be to the greatest benefit of the faith community and how to engage that more and more. Maybe this is a question connected to the prior one. What I'm struggling with is the whole concept of faith. When we say that faith is practiced outside of the parish, 
I don't know what, I don't know how to divorce Catholic faith from the identification with the Mass and sacraments. You know, so to say, how does one practice faith apart from that? I know the faith isn't just that. It's the whole kit and caboodle. So to have people say, well, I practice my faith outside of the parish. What does that mean, really? And is that really faith? You know, um, and, I, and that is, that's my hang-up. That's my struggle at the moment. I don't know, mm -hmm. you know, yes. how that works. I, I would agree with you. I mean, I, I, I try to fathom it. But the reality, particularly in the Latin American context, is that uh, parishes uh, are fairly marginal to the life of the Catholics of Latin America. So th this has had the, the highest ratio of Catholics to priests and Catholics to parishes. You know, so across Mexico, you know, you have many Catholic communities where mass is actually only celebrated once a month. Um, you know, that a, a, a parish, you know, dwarfs St. Matthew's and there's just a single priest. So it's the reliance back to catechists, on the lay ministries, on these family devotions. So, I dare say, for the majority of the Catholics of the world, uh, parish is not the central event. You know, that, that really is much more that experience in North America and, and in Europe, uh, but not in, in other parts of the world. So, it's hard for me to imagine how that is, but we document it is, and w we can't easily turn around and look at Latin America and say, well, the most Latin American part of the world, somehow you've, you've not been Catholic. <laughs> they are. It is. Uh, so, well, well, it's highlighting the data. So the celebration of the Eucharist is the central gathering point of the Catholic community, kind of period. So, but how does that happen, or can it happen? And if it can't happen, how does the faith live? And so we see around the world, you know, the experiences of millions, billions of Catholics. So yeah, I mean, I agree with you. I'm, uh, to me, it, it's a, it's a real quandary. Uh, yet looking at this reality and, and how faith is then communicated generation to generation. Um, I, I, I was struck, uh, uh, among all your wonderful statistics and graphs, I was uh, struck by that kind of low uh, weekly mass attendance. So this somewhat relates to the previous question. Um, and you said it's been pretty consistent over 20 years, but 50 years ago it was much higher, right? I mean, like before Vatican II, wasn't the average mass attendance like 60 or 70 percent among Catholics? I mean, you said it was a mortal sin to miss. <laughs> I, so, surely it's not just because we, we feel less concerned about the mortal sin issue. Very good, very good question, and I have a very good Jesuit answer. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, the impression or that we get is that everybody went to church, you know, back before in the 50s. Um, the, the reality is that uh, uh, that just is not correct. So part of it is George Gallup, when he began national polling, one of his earliest questions, because he had a particularly religious focus, which is, was asking people about church attendance. Gallup, in the original surveys, they were person to person, face to face, you know, knock on the door and ask people. So when I come up, you know, did you go to church on Sunday? You know, people said, yeah, of course. <laughs> So when, when after, you know, when you move into the 60s and Gallup and others move to telephone polls, and now I call up Joe and uh, he's like, well, yeah. Uh, 
And it's fascinating, the same year that Gallup moved from in-person to telephone poll, church attendance in the United States dropped like 15%. <laughs> and more recently, as this moved from telephone to more internet-based on that, guess what? Church attendance dropped. So it, it's a common phenomenon in terms of kind of the social acceptability answers. And so the reliance is much more back to the internet-based or the non-either face-to-face or telephone because people will tend to respond with what they think the questioner wants to hear. So we can kind of see these clear items. and So we start working on that. So a number of the polling services still rely on a lot of the telephone poll and, and uh, some of the Internet. At CARA, we do almost entirely based uh, Internet polling side to it. We deliver, you know, for some of the national studies on this, some of the lowest church attendance rates. To our credit, I think, the American bishops, they commission CARA. And they believe CARA, that that matches up. They, they, they rather have the high number, but they know in their own experience that, that no, no, this is more correct what we're getting. So when we see that across the board, the other part, the, the Jesuit piece of this answer is everybody was convinced, especially through the 50s and the kind of the church triumphal days, everybody's going to church. Father Joseph Fichter, a Jesuit from New Orleans, uh, a sociologist, he just said that, that's, that's not true. So in those days, as back in the 50s, he simply got all his graduate students and he sent them to parish after parish through New Orleans. And then he did this again in several other cities and counted how many people were in the church for every single mass. And they got these counts. And they did not come anywhere near what people were reporting. And God bless Father Victor, he's the only actual you know, objective data collection that was done. And so while people were saying, no, 70% of Catholics went to Mass, he's coming back saying, well, no, it's maybe half, you know, this. And then he documented why, and he has his books where he's writing it at the time, showing almost a similar pattern of those that were regular weekly Sunday attenders, those that were fairly regular, those that went to, you know, once a month or so, the Easter Catholic, and it's not that vastly different. So we have moved more from the weekly to more the monthly. But once we get after that monthly, that 50%, uh, his was not that much smaller. Uh, so you have that. When he wrote this in the 1950s, um, he got into trouble. There were bishops who wanted his writing censored and... Uh, but, he's, you know, he carried the day ultimately. But his piece was, you know, no, let's go count the noses. How many people actually showed up at St. Peter's? You know, F Father Stevens might say there were a 1,000 people at the masses, but there were only 710. You know, so. We have time for two more questions. Okay. This gentleman in the back, I'm sorry, just trying to... So uh, looking at the statistics from before, it looked like about... Half the people in Charlotte were were white, going to ca Catholics, and about a quarter Hispanic, and about a quarter other. Yeah. Um, that's not reflected in the population here, clearly. Um, how, how do you get those numbers? What we went back through is going back to the U.S. Census and state data, so we get exactly how many people you know were in the Charlotte diocese, and then we break it down by ethnicity. And that's a, you know, and so that's kind of the most, the clearest, the most definitive number. So if the U.S. Census Bureau says in 2010, you know, there are X number, and then we break that down on the ethnicity uh, by uh, the uh, country of origin, because we know that if you are Mexican, and that you're Mexican-born, the likelihood is that you would be like 82% Catholic identified but that if you were, I believe it's Guatemala, it might be only about 50%. And if you were an Uruguayan, it'd be like 20%. You know, so 
Catholic, the Catholicity is very different country to country. We do that then with immigrants from Africa. Which country are you coming from? Uh, so we keep tweaking it in these different measures uh, that way to, to match up uh, what we're getting. What we came, our challenge in particular that took a lot more work was dealing with African-American Catholics in southern Maryland and Louisiana uh, because it happened to be two areas where uh, you would get a majority of African-Americans would be Catholic. Uh, readily. So in our other estimates, we had to redo that uniquely, you know, for those areas. So th those are ones we put a big asterisk by on that. But other dioceses, you know, when we get it, you know, don't go to the bank on that exact number. You can go to the bank on the proportion <laughs> uh, is, is there. But that was part of the why. What was happening at the Bishop's Conference, the different Catholic communities are all coming up with different numbers and counts. So we surveyed and tallied every parish in the United States, 17,000 parishes, and asking, do you have a particular pastoral ministry to any ethnic, cultural, national groups? And then documenting all of that. But, you know, we, we had problems that some dioceses just said, no, they didn't have anything like that, and we knew that there were. So I don't know why the diocese did that, but we're also going through double-checking because we would get different sources, references, on who is who to kind of get. And what the bishops wanted was here was one definitive list used the same criteria. You know, and if we said there were 412 African-American parishes, we gave you 412 <coughs> names of parishes and their street address to go with it. Whereas we're asking groups, and they say there are 400 parishes. Who are they? Oh, we don't have that list. How do you know there are 400? Uh, you know, somebody said that before. So this was our effort was to document every piece of it. Yeah, um, first I wanted to just tell you, from my opinion, I thought you did a great presentation. Oh, thank you. Not only was it informative, but your presentation skills are second to none. They're oh, really good. Um, so my question is this. I was three years of high school teaching. <laughs> <laughs> my question is this. Um, so how does a church like St. Peter, not really having an identifiable boundary, reach out to the community of Mecklenburg County and beyond to get them on this journey without being accused by the parishes surrounding us of poaching their population. <laughs> well, if the focus is to get those who are on the ecclesial boundaries or peripheries, perimeter, I'm sorry, I guess the term used, uh, I don't think any other parish is going to mind. Uh, and the other one is uh, the growth in the area of Charlotte is so phenomenal that I just can't imagine. And this is 30 years ago when I was director of planning. People kept saying, oh, if we open St. Matthew's, you know, St. Vincent's, St. Gabriel's, uh, they'll just fall apart. <laughs> they didn't miss a beat. Uh, so I, I, the, the challenge is just trying to figure out how. You know, and, and I, it, again, it goes back to the environment. Looking up what is the immigrant community in Charlotte, and kind of getting a sense roughly, you know, well, what's the Nigerian population in Charlotte? You know, and if we assume that 25, 30 percent of them are Catholic, you know, is there evidence that they're fully engaged in the church? Or maybe we should find a way. And again, it would be normally an immigrant pattern. You know, immigrants don't live 10 miles from one another. You know, they tend to start moving into similar apartment blocks or neighborhoods or areas just for familiarity. So do we make an effort? You know, such and such apartments off of Independence Boulevard, you know, there, there are numerous uh, East African families. You know, do we make an effort to go and invite people and engage them? I mean, so it's just trying to think of what's the context? How does this happen? Um, you know, I think uh, 
if Father McCreesh was here, he'd be back down saying, you know, 15% of the homeless are Catholic. So let's, I'm going to go out and find them and, and see what they have to say. Uh, you know, that, that was a part of, I can remember whether you did the story in The Observer early in the days for Father McCreesh. And people didn't want to address the homeless situation. And Father Gene, you know, his little master at the PR side. So he and one or two other people would go out every night starting about 9, 10 o'clock at night to find who was sleeping under the bridges and to bring them to the shelter or find, bring them someplace, bring them here. We came to this hall. Um, he did this, but he made sure over at the Observer, they were aware of this. <laughs> and he played up being, you know, just the older, simple priest. <laughs> you know? So, so it's, I'm just a simple country parson from North Carolina. <laughs> uh, and he got this cover story in, in the Observer. And it played exactly that piece. That here's this, playing himself as kind of this elderly priest. As we're all settling in to go to bed at night, He's starting, and he's going to find who's under the bridge and who needs help. Well, I mean, he did this for so much, but he got enough attention. Others started doing it. You know, so, I mean, I think it's uh, – Father Gene's piece was not the participating in a synod, but Father Gene's piece was, this is my brother and sister. I have to listen. I have to accompany. They're not going to be left alone. Uh, and I think the same way we need to try and – how do we take his example, you know, and repeat it ourselves for whoever uh, is out there? Wonderful. So thank you again, Father Gaunt, for your informative presentation and for spending time with us today. So thank you very much. It's been delightful for the invite. And I'll just plug, I left back there copies of the CARA report. There are two different copies. It's our quarterly uh, publication. And so if you want to subscribe to it, it would be wonderful that comes out. And then up here on the, the desk, we have two of our, our more recent books. One are on the Catholic parishes of the 21st century, taking all the kind of care data research we've done on the changes there. And just from about three years ago is our book on the uh, Catholic bishops of the United States. So uh, if you want to know all the details and how much sleep or exercise and different things that uh, the bishops have, uh, it's the go-to source. So we have a book coming out in April on American sisters, U.S. sisters. And uh, the studies I was citing today about young adults, uh, that will come out in September uh, on the young adult faith engagement. So thank you. It's been an honor to come here. Thank you to Father, and thank you also to the committee members uh, for putting together their efforts to bring our program today. Have a great day.